fucked up. No, you be throwing t-shirts left, right, and center. Exactly. Hey, I know you. Uh, exactly. Anything to throw stuff at people. Steve, I have to admit that I'm sorry. I will not take it. What? Yes. You I wanted to. You're the worst. No, I wanted to. I attended this yesterday. Uh, uh, I don't care. Wait. No, no, I care. I care. I, mean, I don't care. I will. I, I love to attend your session. No. But I have my cousin coming here from that. Oh, That's so nice. That's the guy. It's my girl. The only oh, girl, the back. of course, the girl. The only woman here. The only poor girl in the session. Oh, yeah. She's not a nerd. She's Sad. not for here, here for you or for me. That's right. She's here with your cousin. Yeah. Okay. So I, was, I will so be so going with them. So oh, we get a network check here. Yes, sir. I didn't know that. So taking What's what I learned anymore? myself from today, okay. I, I've just re taking what I learned myself from today. I've reached out to. So what's your Twitter user name? Python user group yeah. in Sydney. You're I'm trying to line up colors. Let me find you. Okay. But, but calm down what I cover. You're not tweeting me. Okay. I've been tweeting you so many times. So, yeah, yeah, I know. You didn't show up in my list. What? The GitHub page? Maybe because I'm offline. Well, the reason Maybe I did that is an experiment because um, if I get the tutorial at PyCon, that's really how you have to do it. I agree. But it doesn't work for us. That's all. I remember seeing it before, yeah. I just couldn't Well, I, I sort of was optimistic that we could okay. actually run it as a mini workshop to follow on yeah, from yeah, brands, yeah. but too many people left, okay. so they weren't set up right. to do it. So Thanks, Mitch. Guys, I will be probably heading out of the conference, so don't wait for me okay. once you go back. We never wait for you anymore. You're going to start no, the party quick early. The, thing is, the, the only thing is, are we going to the, to the party tonight? Then ping me, or... Okay, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever, yeah. because uh, they will be leaving if they, they go to Friday night again this okay. afternoon. So I will be joining afterwards. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. That was a great talk. No, the good yeah. thing, I mean, I was thinking that it was going to be a crappy talk. And people was listening so carefully. Yeah. It was not huge charge, but yeah, yeah, good. Lots of uh, yeah, really lots of good questions. I, the only thing I would say for yes. the next version of it um, is talk about less patterns and demo. Marek is demoing that. Okay, but even, of course, even for you, but just no. But three. forty minutes, you can. I mean, you cannot do a, a patterns and yes or one. You can, you can show at least two. One. You can show. You can yeah, show but two. you can show two. Here's all I'm going to say. Yeah. You can do one where you but change. But Marek is Marek is doing that in the workshop. The whole. I'm saying for the next yeah. time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Change, no, but once change the deployment config and once change the labels. Just show how those two things yeah. work, and then people will get it. And I would do it early. Yeah. In the talk, so people. Yeah. The thing is, the, yeah. The thing is that next time, one hour talk, I do that. Okay. Forty minutes talk. Yeah. I don't want yes, to cut down the content because I know that people want to know sir, all yeah. of them, and it's not the same. When you do the talk and you ask questions, yeah. and if you see the slides and you don't have anybody to ask, right? It's true. Are we supposed but to I, be starting right now? Okay, bye. Are we supposed to start now, or how? When do we start? Uh, what? <laughs> Who said that? Jakob said that, right? Yeah. Jakob, you have to lead now. <laughs> you Mask. Know, Security. Senator of the principal's he, office. What Security. Are you, what are you talking about? You don't oh, that know one. Important stuff. You're late. Get two minutes. He, Jakob can't go? No, he's our dementia best He can't go. Exactly. You know, our dementia best stuff. And most of all, he needs to learn the stuff that you are talking about. <laughs> this is the, uh, the talk is being hosted. It's live on a website. So if you want to actually bring up the slides yourself, you probably want to do that because there's some links in it as well. If you, so this is a hands-on workshop. We have an hour and a half. Right, so it's two sessions, right? That's what I remember. Does everybody know that they're, they've signed up for an hour and a half workshop? Yes, good. So now is the time, this is the flight to the hour and a half session. If you boarded the wrong flight in error, please make your way to the exit and board your proper, the appropriate flight. Um, this is gonna be hands-on. I'm gonna introduce some concepts and then you're gonna do some very simple application deployment and configuration on OpenShift V3, okay? Uh, we're not gonna do it, actually any edit code changes, although you're quite welcome to do that later if you want, and I can show you how. We're also not even gonna use the command line tools. We're gonna do all of this in the web interface. Okay, so you do not, in the other sessions going on today, everybody had to use command line tools. Um, today we do not have to because we're doing a very simple app. 
Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, let me ask uh, quick, some quick questions to level set. How many of you have used OpenShift V3? Really, the Red Hat people that are on my team aren't raising their hands? Nice. Um, how many of you have, have done spatial work before? GIS, something like that. What have you used? Post GIS? We've implemented our own GIS server. Fun. Nice. Yeah, what did you? Post GIS, leaflet. OK, so when I do the leaflet part, you're allowed to check your email. But the other part, you're not allowed. OK? Based on Oracle. Oh, more can, yeah. Yeah. Anyone else <laughs> doing spatial work? Nobody. Okay, so uh, this is, I'm going to assume most people have not used OpenShift. Most people have not done spatial work. How many people have written a web application and used index, like a JavaScript file? Okay, good. Uh, how many of you are Java developers? Most? Okay, if you're not, I apologize, I'm going to have to show Java code. It was kind of in the talk title, I believe. Uh, that I was going to do. No, it wasn't in the abstract. No, I deleted Java from your abstract. If you really don't want to see any Java code, if it offends you on a deep moral level, I will understand if you get up and leave now as well. And then we're going to show. How many of you used Mongo? Yeah, only the only the people who did OpenShift V2 know Mongo. Okay, so I'm going to actually talk about all of them. Good. So the agenda is very simple. A little bit about MongoDB spatial. Only the spatial bits of it. Some Java EE. And then, no, that's not happening. Ignore that one. Uh, we're going to actually deploy some code, OK, and have an app running. And then you deploy. Assumptions, you, you can ignore that one because we're not going to write any. And then you will ask questions. How many people have already gotten a beautiful scarf? How many people have already gotten a beautiful scarf? Only three. OK, so ask a question. Get a beautiful scarf. And I give out multiple scarves to the same people if you have a partner at home that needs a scarf or a dog, not for a cat, though. Um, what's the scenario that we're doing? We work for a vendor that sells beer at baseball stadiums, and since it's, well, most other countries, beers at baseball stadiums in the United States. Does everybody know what baseball is? You throw the, it's like cricket, only just as confusing, right? If you throw the ball, you hit it with the bat, and you run around the bases, right? And there's a lot of it in the United States. We're making a check-in service to help drive traffic to our crappy beer stands. We sell very bad beer. We want to try to get more people to come to the stations to hopefully maybe sell more beer. Okay? We want it free and open source on the whole stack, no lock-in. And it's due next week. So your product manager comes to you and says, this has to happen by next week. Right? So you have to do this actually relatively quickly. Uh, oh, this is where I hate. Let's see if I can get this to go smaller. Can you read that in the back now, though? No. Kind of. The old men can't. But the old, and maybe the old men should all move up to the front of the classroom so that they can read the stuff on the slide. I'm here already. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a bunch of different type of NoSQL data stores. right? So I want to put my uh, MongoDB where it sits in the ecosystem. So I'm assuming everyone's heard of NoSQL. Is that about right? Yeah? NoSQL data stores? Okay, so I'm going to go through a bunch of different types. I'm going to give you an example, and then usually the use cases that they're used for. So there's document data stores, and I'm not talking about like a Word document or a PDF. I mean like you're actually storing a doc data document into the database. There's two main types of that, MongoDB and Couchbase, or CouchDB, right? And they're usually used for document storage and search. So you put in a document of data, and you store and you search it. And we're going to cover Mongo more today. There's key value, and those are usually, examples of that are Redis, React, Memcache, right? And so that's usually caching or an object store. So you have a key and a value, and that's all you have in the table, right? You have a key and a value. So this is really good for something like a web page, where the key is the URL, and the value is the rendered HTML for the web page, right? Very quick and easy to pull out the web page and serve it back up. And it's just coming out of memory rather than having your server work on There's graph databases. These are Neo, the prime example I think of this is Neo4j. And this is used for storing relationships between objects. So if you think of something like Twitter or Facebook where there's a social graph, you can very easily do this in a graph database. It stores like, the, you know, prime example is they do like Star Wars. And they say Darth Vader is the father of Luke and Leia. 
and then they do the reverse on that graph, which they say Luke and Leia, you know, are children of Darth Vader, and then they have like trained with, and they do the whole graph. That's what you do with graph databases. It's also usually very good for certain types of geographic data. Do you guys, is everybody here from the Czech Republic, or most people, if you're not from the US? Yeah? Poland? Anybody else besides the Czech Republic that wants to get a scarf? This is an easy question. You just say which country you're from. You what country are you from? Russia. Russia. You already have a scarf. You're even wearing a scarf. If you want another one. It's good, but it's cold there, so you should wear both at the same time. Okay. So um, in the United States, and I don't know if you have it in the Czech Republic, but we have the, when they do the census. Does everybody know what the census is? You know, when you go around and you count all the people, they break that into geographic entities that nest inside of each other. Right, so it's a hierarchical data set. Those work really well in Neo4j because you can walk the leaf down the tree all the way down, back up and down the tree to find which geography you're in. Data processing, this is things like Hadoop and Cassandra and Voldemort. And these are large data processing. And then there's MISC. And this I put in things that don't fit into the other large categories. So examples in here are Lucene, Solar, and Elasticsearch. That's kind of one whole thing. Lucene and Lucene is the basis for both Solar and Elasticsearch. Um, and those are, that's document in the Word, PDF document or Word document. It's a free text index for searching for things. It actually has spatial as well. This has spatial. Some of these have spatial. These have spatial. Um, Volt DV I put in there because I know it's made by Stonebreaker, but I don't know what the hell it does. So I just put it in just so because Stonebreaker has done so much before that I feel like he earns having me mention his database, but I don't actually know what it does. Yeah, here. Harrison, do you know what it does? Yeah, it's, it's optimized for uh, high, in, high volume input. So it's optimized for writes. And then but is it a relational database? It is, yes, it is ACID compliant, compliant but it's really optimized for writes and then you use something else to mine the data afterwards. And then serve it back up for reads? Right. Okay, thanks. I still won't say that in the next show I go to because then someone will think I know something about Volt <laughs> Um So that's the different types of NoSQL data stores. And now I'm going to just talk about Mongo. And now I can make this bigger, I think. So a bit about MongoDB. A document, when we're talking about Mongo, is just a bunch of attributes and values. So for those of, since I assumed you were Java developers, that's a, like a hash map in Java, right? And in uh, Python, it's a dictionary, right? It's just hash, value, hash, value. And just like in both of those languages, dictionaries can contain dictionaries. Hash maps can contain hash maps. They can contain lists. The same thing can happen in a MongoDB document. Right? So it's a JSON document, is really what it is. Right? Except it's actually BSON, not JSON. So BSON, B-S-O-N, is binary script object notation. Right? And the reason why they're using BSON rather than JSON is they want the ability to actually store dates. Dates are used a lot in databases. And if you put it in as a string, you can't do as much. In BSON, it's actually a date, and you can do queries against dates like range queries on dates and stuff like that. Uh, I, already uh, I already explained this. It can be nested, which helps to avoid joins. The main reason why people built, the founders who built MongoDB in the beginning was they wanted to get away from MySQL and they wanted to avoid, avoid joins, right? And this is really good for something like a social check-in service, right, where you have somebody checking in at a bunch of geographic locations you can actually have the person and store all of their geographic locations that they've checked in in their document. So, or you can store the last three or something like that, places they've checked in. So that way, when you say, hey, give me this person's check-in history, it just pulls one, it does one query and pulls back the document and can display all of it. And you've never done a join. Does that make sense? Right? This, so everything that comes with this, I'm going to give you the bad part about it too. Right? I am not necessarily like MongoDB all things. The bad, what's the bad part about this? You can, I'm not going to give it to you. You're going to tell me. What's the bad part about a, not having joins? Okay. What? Redundant data. Redundant data and updating of it. But you're not getting another. Do you need another? No, no. You don't need another scarf? I have a bunch of them. You have a bunch of them? No, no I'm just kidding. You're going to go sell them when you go back to Russia then? No, I have <laughs> Okay. Um, you have two kids? Is that what you said? Oh, no, no. That's a lot. All right. Um, because I'll give you another one if you have another kid. Uh, so you're right, you end up with redundant data. So if, you, if you're storing all the locations where the person checked in and somehow the title of that location has changed, 
you can't, you have to actually go search for all the old locations and update them manually rather than updating them in one table. Right? So there's a really bad chance of getting data orphans in here. Uh, it's schemaless. And what I should say is the schema is free form. It has a schema, but it, MongoDB never enforces its schema at all. Right? So another thing that the people who were building Mongo did when they wanted to start was they wanted to aim it towards developers rather than people who have to deal with Oracle. Right? So when you, do you work with a company with a big Oracle schema and you have a lot of database administrators? Or is it just you? We have just two schemas. Okay, but if you want to make a change to the schema, do you have to put in a change request? Yes. Yeah. So, and then how long does it take to get that change request? Change. That depends. It's, uh, we drive all this ourselves. So we, we are when they don't let you do it, you And customers. We don't have a customers who develop something on top of our platform. Okay, but when you have to ask a DB admin for a schema change, and you put in a change request, how long does that usually take, if you can't do it yourself? Uh, it, it, if it would be just a schema change, it would be done within an hour. Okay, so when I, but you're still waiting to write your code for about an hour. Yeah, but if I have to write the code and do things more, it, it's of course longer because we will have to deploy it. Okay, so you have to deploy it and all that stuff. With Mongo, as soon as you change your code, it makes the change to the database. So if you say, oh, I've changed this table, I, you know, I need another column, which is great. Your product manager comes to you and says, oh, I need their identification or their passport number. So when you modeled the user, you didn't have that in there before. You had a line in your code that says insert passport number, and the, you put it into the same collection, which is like a Mongo table, and suddenly you have passport numbers getting inserted into the documents, and they go in no problem. That's pretty nice, right? You never have to talk to a DB admin. You actually don't even have to write any DDL statements. Right, there's no writing any schema, it just goes. What's the bad part about that? If two people make a change, they will, they will conflict with each other. That's right. So the bad part about that is I put the table I, I write the name to be passport NO, and someone else writes the name to be passport num in their code, and now we've got two different fields getting pushed into the collection, and they're not the same. Right? And you don't and you have no way of knowing. So there's been times when my code in one piece doesn't match the query that I'm doing or I'm inserting by hand. And I'm like, where did my data go? And what it did is it and actually with Mongo, you can go all the way up to the collection level. Actually, even the DB level. If your code uses the a slightly different DB name, Mongo will just go ahead and make a completely new DB. Right? So you could be writing into two completely different DBs and you'd be like, where's all my data? And you don't know. Or, if you're putting in numbers into a field and someone doesn't get the message that it's supposed to be a number and they start putting in strings, Mongo's not going to care. It's not going to stop you from being stupid. Right? So we're, basically, what ends up happening with Mongo is all the stuff that we liked being baked into relational databases, you have to move up into your application tier. That's what's happening. It's really good at fast writes, but you give up immediate consistency. Right? So you can, tu you can tune it so that it actually does one phase transactions. So it says, I don't, I, don't want you to, I don't want you to return back to me until you've actually written it to the database. And it's been sharded out. But at that point, your speed is the same as a relational database. Right? So what a lot of people use Mongo for is because it's really good at fast writes. It's, you can actually tune it to say, as soon as the network stack gets the packet saying they want the write, not even into memory, just as the network stack gets it, return back to the, return back to the client and say, you got it. Right? So that's really great if you're writing some sort of like a logging application where you're grabbing log files where you don't care if you miss a few here and there, but you really may want to make sure that you're not blocking on anybody trying to write. You can basically just keep plowing stuff in and as soon as it hits the network stack, it says, great, go back, great, go back. So like, that's why all the Node.js people loved it. Right? Because with all that async stuff, they could just return right back with the async stuff right away. Does everybody get that part? The par problem, though, is if that machine goes down, any time after it's hit the network stack, you're not, your data is never going to get written. This is supposed to be easy to horizontally scale. I have not done this myself, and I've heard varying reports from the field about how easy that is. Um, it was built, though, at a time when hard, the developers already understood that the new way of scaling is not vertical anymore, it's horizontal. So it is built in with sharding and a whole bunch of other stuff, and you can do commands that just say shard away, and it goes and shards. 
But I don't know how reliable those are. The, did we ever have any problems with that on the OpenShift clusters or anything? With the sharding, did we ever do sharding or anything like that? Does anybody know? No? Okay. So, that's it for Mongo. Any questions about Mongo? We're all good? Yes? Okay. Now some spatial. So this is like, you know, in the world. The spatial func functionality Mongo currently has is very simplistic. There's near. So tell me things that are near me. Right? Here's a point. What's near this point? This is a line. Show me other points or lines that are near this line. Right? Containment. So containment says this is the city boundaries of Brno. Show me all the restaurants in the city boundaries of Brno. Show me all the post office codes that are in and their areas that are inside the city of Brno. Does everybody get within? Right? So the thing with containment, though, is it has to be completely contained. What you can also do is intersection. So what intersection says, are you within or do you cross the boundary of? Right? So this is saying, show me any um, postal code that may actually intersect the city limits of Brno boundary. But for those of you who have used, well, there's only one person here who's used a spatial database, right? Is, you'll agree, this is not, have you guys heard of PostGIS? It's Oracle Spatial on Postgres, and it basically is like a complete GIS system. And you can do all sorts of really fancy modeling, things like buffering. So you can say, take all the restaurants, buffer 10 meters, intersect that with all the rail lines, and show me all the rail lines that are actually close, all the pieces of the rail lines that are close to restaurants. You cannot do that here, right? Because you can only, you could say, show me all the restaurants that are within 10 miles of this rail line or all rail lines, but you can't actually then say, give me back those pieces of the rail line that are exactly there. Does that make sense? So it's really about querying is all it is. You cannot do spatial operations. You can just query in MongoDB. But what that turns out to be is that for most, that's about 70, maybe 60% of the spatial use cases. Most people, when they're thinking about doing something spatial, it's what's called pins on a map. Right? I put a bunch of pins on the map and I want to find things near the pins or something like that, right? Most of us don't do complex spatial operations. So this actually worked great for this. Uh, because I said this is up and online, you can go back and read more if you want to read more about the details later about how it all works. Okay? Like their implementation and everything. There's two types of indices. There's 2D for flat surfaces and 2D sphere. And this helps with coordinates on an Earth-like sphere. Right? There's very different calculations for distance and area and all those things depending on whether you're working on a flat surface or you're working on a sphere. Most of the maps we look at are 2D, but what comes out of these things? GPS coordinates, which are on a sphere. Latitude and longitude with some particular datum. I'm not going to talk about datums today because most of us won't actually use code today. But the idea is they have built this so that when you're getting GPS units, you can do really good distance calculations. Right? For where you're near and within and all that stuff. This can be any arbitrary 2D surface. So we could actually map out this room, give coordinates for everybody's position relative to that corner or that corner, so everybody would have a position. And then we could say, who is the closest person sitting next to Mark? Right? It would probably be the guy in front of you. Right? But all we could say, find all the people sitting within 10 meters of Mark or 10 units of whatever we choose to map the room in. So people can also, use, you could use this for things like electronics ports, your backyard, or if you get data for, that has already been projected. And I'm not going to talk too much more about that. So good to know, it handles GeoJSON natively. So GeoJSON is the JSON standard for handling geodata. Okay, and it has a particular format. And if you work with latitude and longitude data, and you're going to do 2D sphere, you have to do GeoJSON. Okay? You don't have to do it for 2D, but for 2D sphere, it's got to be in GeoJSON. And it'll, but by doing that, though, in, what are the units on here? 
Like what are the units, what are the units for a position? Degrees. Degrees, right? Did you get a, did you get a scarf yet? Yeah, a couple of them. <laughs> People are stealing my thunder. Okay, so it, it's degrees. So if I asked you, how far is 0.1 degrees from where I'm standing right now? How many of you would be able to figure out when you got to about 0.1 degrees? Depends where we are. It depends, and it also would depend where we are in the sphere even. Right? It's arbitrary depending on whether you're close to the equator or close to the pole. So that makes calculations and output very hard if you're just dealing with these things. If you put it in a GeoJSON, Mongo is smart enough to give you the units back in either meters or feet, depending on what you want, rather than back in units of degrees. Oh, it's in meters. Sorry, not feet. It assumes when you're making the spatial index, it assumes the coordinates are between minus 180 and up to 180. Why is that? Somebody new who needs a scarf gets a first chance at asking. Why do you think they made the index range by default that? Somebody need a scarf? I have one. Someone, you already have one too? Does somebody not have a scarf? Okay, so one, do one of you want to answer? I, I'll be nice. Why do you think the index, is, if you just even talk and give a guess as to why, you'll get a scarf. Why do you think they chose this range for the index? Think about a globe. For, for the degrees, right? Exactly. It's because the maximum degrees you can ever get on the globe of the Earth is 180 degrees either east or west of the prime meridian. Right? So if we actually did that 2D with the room and we were using centimeter accuracy, it's much more than 180 centimeters to map out the whole room in each direction. When you make the index, you'd have to pass in the new range for the index. Okay? And then just because the only person, I don't want you going home without a scarf, I'm just going to give you one anyway, just for raising your hand saying you didn't have a scarf. Marek, what? I'm going to need some scarves for the next session, please, so don't be... <laughs> there's, a, there's one person left in the room who didn't have a scarf, and now everybody is scarf. You don't? Are you staying for the next session? Okay, well, you better stay if you want to scarf. Because I'm done. <laughs> Um, and also, there's a, also a, a, a formula to convert to human readable units if you keep it in lat long. Right? It's called the Haberstein formula. And that actually helps you convert from lat long to feet and meters. So how do you make it work? So this is the part where the only person who's going to appreciate how simple this is is the guy who's worked with Oracle Spatial before. Because it's incredibly simple to make it work. So you e if you're using, you either make, you make a field in... Uh, your JSON, right? So this is location, and those are the coordinates. This is for 2D. If you're going to put it in, if you're going to do, if you use latitude and longitude with a default index, make sure to put it in longitude latitude first, because that's GeoJSON. That's GeoJSON format, right? This is just straight. You can just make it location 50, 30. I think Grant, is that what we did in our example? You just used a straight field like that, not GeoJSON, right? We should have used GeoJSON. So we're not showing you best practices in the example. We're going to use, Geo, this is GeoJSON, it's very similar. There's a field, location, it's got a hash inside of it, which is type, is point, coordinates, and then an array of the coordinates with longitude and latitude first. Let me look, we may have done that. We may have, okay. We'll, we'll see later, everybody will be, we have the source code, everybody will get to look. So that's it, you just put your data in. And remember, yeah, we did it right? I love when we're good. Um, so with this, do you remember, you don't have to declare any of these fields beforehand. There's no DDL to write, which is part of the part that's really annoying in Oracle Spatial. And then, after you've done that, you just say DB, your collection, which is your table, ensure index, what, pick whatever field has the coordinates in it, and say 2D sphere. And it indexes the data with a 2D sphere index, and you're done. Your data is now spatial. So put your data in, make an index on it, and you're done. That is probably the easiest way ever to get spatial data in. Am I right? Compared to Oracle Spatial? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> I know you were going to say yes, but you, you get... So the, what they've traded is ease of use for power and flexibility. Right? This is very easy to use, but it becomes much harder to use if you move any way off the normal use case and you don't get what you normally want to do. Or you can make a 2D index, which is DB places and true index, the field, and just 2D. Okay? And that's it. And you're done. So now I'm going to switch to JEE.
For those of you who are not Java developers, you can kind of pay attention. I'm, we're going to go through the code later. If you're a Java developer, have you used JAXRS? Are there any Java developers who've not used JAXRS? You haven't? I haven't. Okay. I wouldn't consider myself a Java developer, even though I've developed some small things in Java. It's not your main language. Yeah. How about CDI? Of all those, so I'm not counting you anymore. You can keep your hand down. <laughs> For those who've actually written like Java web applications, how many of you have you not used CDI? You've not used contend okay context dependency injection. I'm not going to go into it in deep. I know it's, I know it's, I know it's, it is, but so it's actually it, now there's an annotation in the new Java EE where you can just CDI stuff, and I'll show it to you later. JAXRS, I'll tell you what it is. JAXRS is the anti-SOAP, which is what Java was known for for the ever. It's the anti-SOAP, it's the REST, making REST interfaces, and it's super duper easy to make it. Like when I actually started using it, I almost felt as hip as Ryan, our Node.js developer. Like I was like, oh, I'm almost as good as him. And I mean, I don't have the hat and the beard yet, but I'm working on it. So it's basically you do a bunch of annotations and you can expose a URL and you actually can do all the serialization and deserialization automatically on the fly and we'll see it later. So that's it for the JAXRS. Leaf flip. So we've handled the data store. We've handled the app server and how we're actually going to do our business logic. Leaflet is what goes on the front end to handle maps. Okay? And so a quick intro. It's a lightweight, very, very lightweight JavaScript client-side library for doing great maps. There's a couple different JavaScript libraries. Um, the other big one compared to this one is called Open Layers. Open Layers comes more out of the GIS world, where it was used for, like, if you need things like an editing toolbar, like you want to edit features on the map and you want to do that stuff, you're going to be looking at Open Layers. Um, Leaflet is much more for that people who want to do pins on a map or heat maps and quick, lightweight JavaScript on top. It came out later than Open Layers, which is to its benefit. It works out of the box with OpenStreetMap, as well as others. But do you guys know what OpenStreetMap is? Who doesn't know what Open... I'm in Europe. I always assume people do know what OpenStreetMap is here. There's one guy shaking his head. So that means that the rest of you don't know what OpenStreetMap is, correct? No. You do? Because you've done this sample. I have before. a question. Why do you expect people in Europe to know OpenStreetMap and not Americans? Like well, be, so because the reason is, one, it can, it's, it's actually the community here even though you guys probably have less people overall than all of the United States, you have way, especially if you just, probably in Germany alone, there is more contributors than there is in all of the United States. It came out of, the guy who started at Steve Coast was in England, and then some companies have, um, some countries have really got on board. It's the Wikipedia of maps. Basically, people go out with their GPS in their phone, or the, when it was first started, it was G, little, little handheld GPS units, would store a track, and then come back, put it up into OpenStreetMap, write the name on it, and then you have a map of the world. Well, that's somewhere. For example, here, the Cadastro Office gave it up. Uh, gave all, all maps here. Not when they started, though. So when OpenStreetMap first started, it was very much this. It then gained enough momentum from people doing things that now we have government agencies just giving their data when they're in this open data, giving it to OpenStreetMap. So it's, and it's free for anybody to download and use. And you can go in and edit it if you want to. So there's a lot, a lot of interesting use cases for this. One is a newspaper back in the States actually hired someone to go out for every story and put a point in OpenStreetMap where that story took place so then the newspaper could actually link back to that story and have people look at that location on a map. Right? And they were free to do that because it's an open database. The other thing that this is really good for is humanitarian errors or humanitarian catastrophes. So, like, do you know what was the latest? The tsunami in in uh, the tsunami in Thailand. Basically, there's there was no maps, uh, really good maps of all the back, or the ones that just happened in Nepal, the earthquake in Nepal. They put out a call for people to map. They divide it up, and people just go in and start mapping all the roads. And basically, within a week, that entire country is mapped, just on volunteers. So, if you're just going to put pins on a map, it's probably the best data layer out there because then you're not tied to putting things into Google. Right? If you're just putting pins on a map. If you're going to be in Germany, you can actually even do routing with it to route cars. Germans have put enough effort in to like have turn restrictions and speed limits and all that stuff. <coughs> Most other countries in the world, and Czech has too. Yeah. Most other countries in the world, like the United States, I wouldn't use it for routing except for bikes and walking. Okay? And you still might tell you to walk off of a 
on-ramp or something like that to the road down below. Uh, and Leaflet's mobile ready. You can see today when you spin up your app, you can go to the URLs with your phone and it'll work. It has a rich library of plugins. So it has things like um, heat maps. Does everybody know what a heat map is? It's like when you have different colors on the map depending on the intensity of stuff. So if you have points with values in them, you can use the heat map plugin to change that into a heat map surface rather than a bunch of points with different colors, which is sometimes better for visualization. Okay, so this, that's it for the slides. That's all the tech we're going to use today. Anybody have any other questions? I'm assuming you'll have questions as we start to do this and we start digging and looking at source code. But if there's any others right now, go ahead. Go for it. Yeah. Yeah. Compared to Cloudant? I haven't used Cloudant, so I don't know. Uh, it's very similar. It's also very similar to Couchbase or CouchDB, right? They're both very similar. You know, it depends on, I think some of it is religious, where people get in their head that this is, their, this is the right thing and you must use it. I think Mongo was very popular for a while. It has be become less and less popular over time is what I would say. There's but usually I, performance trade-offs, slight performance trade-offs, some are... So like one example is between CouchDB and Mongo. CouchDB, you have to predefine all of your indexes. You can't make indexes on the fly. Right? So you can't do queries off a of random data. At least it used to be. In CouchDB, you couldn't just arbitrarily query your document. In Mongo, you could. But CouchDB actually started up an HTTP server, so any queries to it were just made old REST calls. Right? So out of the box, you could already serve up your data. All right. So now, that's, any other questions? So I don't know the exact... You're going to have to look for some blog post or some article that talks about document data stores and performance benefits. Everybody ready? Who's going to actually do the exercises or try? Only four people? Five people? Okay, ready? <laughs> For the rest of you, you can just watch me because I'll do all the exercises too. Um, for the rest of you on your lap, that doesn't mean you get to do YouTube and all those other things though, okay? If you're not following along. Open this repo. This is the re GitHub repo we're going to use. Mark, are you going to use this one later too in the next session? Yes, sir. Okay. If you're going to do Marek session later, are you going to show webhooks? Yes, sir. If you're going to use Marek session, go ahead and actually, and you've used GitHub before, and I don't have to explain it all to you. Go ahead and fork this and make your own repo, and then use the use that URL instead. If you're not going to be in Marek session later, which I feel bad for you that you're not, uh, go ahead and just use this one. Open it up, and then also open the web console here. This is the instance that you're going to use. If you're going to do the exercise, please raise your hand. I have to give you a number. Okay, raise it high until I give you a number. User 01, user 02, 03, 04, 05, 06. Do you want to do it? You're kind of jealous that these other people are going to go home with working apps and you're not. You're 07. Anyone else? Actually, Steve, it might be best to start it if you're 01. Start at 50. Start at 50? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I what, you know, there's this thing about like time is kind of linear in our conception, and if you had actually told that to me before I started, no, no. There, there may be a possibility that this already exists. Well, I'll just have to make a new project. Good. Okay. I'm going to go into zero, zero. Wow. All right. So I don't need my slot. I keep forgetting that I'm not. So here's the G Shipley open shift. Okay. I'm going to start firing up the app with you guys, and then we'll come back and look, look at the source code, because it's going to take a little while for things to get going. So here we are. Everybody should be looking at something like this. I want those who are following along to put, log in. And it was dev, devconf is the password for everybody. So the password for everybody is all lowercase. We, we care about security a lot. And the password for everybody is devconf. So don't hack each other's accounts. There's no competition here. It's not like if you do, there's no best in app, okay? So please be nice to each other. So the URL, does everybody get that URL for the web console? That's not my presentation. Where'd it go? Oh, it's over here. Again, if you, do you want the app, do you want the link for the slides? Oh, it's up there too? Yeah. Yeah, but that's so much to type. Ah. It's really easy to click on the link. So. Let me just go back to the first page of the slide deck.
This is probably easier for you to type in. Talks about the steed zero, that's a zero, dot com. J E E map V3. And then go to the slides that uh, has the links to the various places. Hey, Grant, yes, since you failed to tell me anything in a proper order, can I ask you a favor, please? Yeah. Could you get me a glass of water or a bottle of water or something, please? <laughs> I don't want any more Cofola. <laughs> I like Cofola. A bomb. Fizzy. No, that doesn't need fizzy, just anything to... I only know about the fizzy water. Okay, that's great. Fizzy water sounds great. Thank you. Yeah. It doesn't have to be. I thought that would be harder. Thanks. Oh, and I'll have one too, Ryan. Thanks. Oh! <laughs> you can tell who the boss of the team is. Get a case. Oh, just get me one too. You can even say that, please. Has everybody got the link? Can I go back to the exercise now? Does anybody not have the link? That's why I should just ask negatives. Does anybody not have the link? Okay, I'm going back. Okay, so go here. Your login is use, your user, whatever, whatever. I still don't have the, this uh, plugin site. It's slow as small as this. Oh, it's the Wi-Fi. Yeah. Wi-Fi is fine. The Wi-Fi is fine? For other people? Everybody else, is it really quick and fine? No, yeah. yeah. okay. it's still so fine. Same for certain people? Okay, for everyone. See, that's because you're using a Mac. Actually, it's a Mac that's working. Is it working? But it works in, working for everybody else? I'm still waiting. Who's still waiting? Harrison. Uh, but Harrison doesn't count. I'm just going to go forward very slowly then. Okay. User zero, 0, or whatever user you are. Is there anybody else who's decided they want to follow along since it's going so well? Okay, and then the password is dev conf. Enter. And you're in. And you should see something that looks like this. Is that what you were seeing? Yes? And we're all, thank you very much. And then we're going to make a new project because there is already the MLB parts in here, if there is one in yours. We're going to make it up in the top right. There is this blue button that says new project. Click on it. And you're going to name it. You can name it whatever you want. I don't care. I'm going to name mine Grant is Rude. And then you can put in a display name, or a, and then I'm going to my display name is Grant was raised by wolves. And then that's it. Okay? And you say create. And you should be looking at something like this. Is this what everybody's looking at? Is still waiting? Uh, I'm still waiting too. Get ready, Mark. Are you hearing? He's still waiting to log in. He's still waiting to log in. Are you still waiting to log in too? What? Can you stop and then restart? Try re reload. You've done that like seventy-five times, and it hasn't still hasn't changed the thing. Not still up the times, but yeah. Eighty. <laughs> <laughs> is, it the, is the server actually slow? I got that back up. It's just the Wi-Fi. It's just the Wi-Fi. Okay. The, the server seems okay. I, I would just list it all the time. No, I, I think it's Wi-Fi because I'm waiting even for that the presentation. Uh, to load as well. And it's just on certain people's machines, and I don't know how that ends up. Like, I'll get disconnected and come back and whatever. So, sorry. You can follow along. I'm going to keep going because i got to keep going. There are some uh, C-sharp people going here who are oh, installing yeah. stuff. They probably have viruses all on their machine. Okay, so the thing that you're going to search for here <laughs> is you're going to search for, in the filter by keyword, you're going to do EAP. Right? And you're going to pick... Let's do, has any, Grant, have you tried it with 1.2? We're going we're gonna to all be guinea pigs. We're going to pick JBoss EAP OpenShift 1.2. So this is a Docker image built by the, S, the SCL and the developer experience team at OpenShift. So it's fully supported. It's EAP 6.4. And the version of it is 1.2. It was actually built by the JBoss team. It was built by the JBoss team, not the SCL team. Yeah. So SCL team, Don't you can stop looking so smug. <laughs> what? Don't give them credit. Exactly. This was built by the J-Boss team. This was built by, like, Bill DeCost and his team? I guess so. We'll say yes. So go ahead and click that. So then the name, this is going to be the name of your application. 
right? Or the name of your project that's going to create a label. I'm not talking about those right now because all we're trying to do is bring up the spatial app. So the name for this will be Mappy. You can call it whatever you want. Map, map. That's my name and my map. It's Mappy Map Map. And the Git repository URL is the is this one right here. You can use the one up at top, but I'll use the one that they give me. You're copying Grant's Git repository. If you forked it, use your URL instead, okay? And then paste that into here. Everybody got that? For those who actually can get to the page? Okay, and then say, create. And that's all you have to do. And so what we have done, that image that we were talking about, the Docker image, is actually a builder image. So it has the functionality inside of it to say, ah, I'm EAP, but I also know how to build if you give me a palm.xml. And so what we did is we gave it a Git repo that has a palm.xml on the base of it. And now what's happening behind the scenes is this image the, Im the original image is pulling in that source code in a tarball into the temp directory, unzip, untarring it, and then proceeding to run Maven build against it. And then when it's finished, it's going to push it into the EAP deploy location, and then save that out as a new Docker image and push it into our registry, all behind the scenes. So if I say it quickie, quickly and simply, it's taking source code in a Docker image and creating a new Docker image that we can run. Right, with the source code in it. And that's what we're doing right there. Okay? And this is the step that actually takes the longest. So if we go back to the overview, you can see that we have a build running. You can click on your build. Right? And we can actually look at the logs. This is new in 3.1 of OpenShift. 3.1.1 or just 3.1? 3.1. This before meant you had, before 3.1, you actually had to SSH into your builder pod and look at the log files there. Now we can watch the build happening. So for those of you who are Java, to build direct, uh, Java people, please explain to the non-Java people what we're waiting for right now. <laughs> what does this look like to you? You don't, get, you don't have to answer. I'm not considering you on the hook. Come on, some of you said you were Java developers. You've used Maven, right? That's pulling some packages from Maven and building. Yeah, it's pulling the internet using and, Maven. And I'm not Java developer. Exactly. This is basically Maven downloading the entire internet yeah. and putting it into our image. Okay? So we're gonna, that's why I said I'm going to start this first, because this is going to take a while. No, it's already done. It's actually pushing the image that takes longer than downloading Maven. Mine's not done. Whose is done? Is mine done? Yeah. I I should, I'm server. watching you, so... Oh, you're at pushing server? Yeah. You're watching me? Yeah. Are you like the creepy sysadmin that goes into everybody's project <laughs> and looks at stuff? <laughs> okay, so then once it did that building, we, in OpenShift, we run an internal Docker registry. Right? And so when that image was built, right, uh, where did it do this? There was the building being done. And it's pushing here into our internal, that resulting Docker image into our Docker registry. And so now, if we go back and we look at our project overview again, we should, you know what, I have a, Jakob, I have, I have another um, feature request. Oh, no, there it is. It's on the right side. Go to top. You can go to overview again. Then you can see We've actually, this hasn't scaled up yet though. We've got a pod now running, the build is done. We can actually go to the deployment. So go to browse, deployments. Does everybody see that? Left side, browse, deployment. So we built a Docker image and now we've moved into the, the phase of deploying that Docker image into the infrastructure. If you don't have your own run, if you don't have your own build cycle, you could actually just deploy a straight Docker image. So here's the deployment. Is it done? It's, it's running. So let's look at that, and we can look at the logs. So it looks like 
it actually looks like it's deployed it, and it's actually now doing a readiness check. Is that correct? Is that, is that, well, is that what it says it's doing here? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. That's what, me as a developer, I understand that it has deployed the Docker image. You can actually set a readiness hook for the Docker image to say, hey, when I return success, that means I'm actually ready to serve up responses. For those of you who are Java developers and have used EAP, how long does it take for EAP to start up? No matter what the middleware team tells you. Sometime. It takes some time. This is not starting Apache. So we might actually be waiting, but I don't know. That's not true. The latest Wi-Fi is pretty OK. Below 10 seconds, if I remember correctly. OK, then explain that. Yeah, it's running in Amazon. That's different. That's different. You know. Oh, on my own laptop? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's running in Amazon. So, no, Has anybody else is here turned blue in the audience? There's a blue circle around it. So yours is working. You may find that the push times out. It hit me during mine. Awesome. So for those of you who are already blue, you can click on this link that's up on top. That's your URL to your app. We created a route to it, and you should see a map with no pins on it. Is that true? Yeah. Isn't that awesome? Fucking it great. <laughs> got a map. I don't know if mine's actually going to. Maybe I should just. I have to wait for it to die, or should I just deploy it again? You, you have can, to wait. You can do the deploy. No, you will not. Show me what I would do again. This is. Browse deploy. Go back to my deploy and fire off another deployment, just, just do that. You say you do. Oh, that's a good pattern. See, this is why we like having the devs here. Yeah, scale down. So when I scale it to zero, that says get rid of anything that's running right now. <coughs> when I was hitting Stop it. Stop messing around with mine. It's the push of the build that's turning. I hit you. What did you do? No, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> that's a it's the push of the build that is timing out, which means you actually got to wait for it to time it. out and it rebuild. You got to rebuild it. It's really annoying. You did actually scale down. I missed one quote in the in the other space, so the quote disappeared. But it's still saying it's scaling to zero. Refresh? Yaku? <laughs> I thought it was using <laughs> WebSockets. <laughs> Jakob, you're the worst mascot ever. <laughs> That's why I obeyed me to resist. Okay, I refreshed and it's still saying I have one pod. I, I browse deployments and start a new one. That's worked oh, for yeah. me in the past. Yeah, yeah. Okay, it's so there's my deployment. It's right not, in the, and yeah. I'm just going to say, <laughs> no I'm not. <laughs> I'm not going to delete it. Okay. Usually you could click there. Yeah. Let me see if I can kill this one. Cancel. I can edit it. Where's the stop button? Oh, do you have cancel There's button? logs you there as run. well. There's logs if you wanted to inspect. Oh, right next to the run. Uh, it's just taking You can see that. It yeah. says cancel rather than stop. Okay. Jakob, <laughs> another issue. <laughs> No, it's not cancel. It's stop the deployment. It's canceling the deployment. <laughs> <laughs> Roll back. It's not rolling back. It's just canceling the current deployment. Yeah. Kill it. Okay. Anyway, I'm going to deploy again. This part actually, when it works, is actually quite fast because all it's doing is reading out of a Docker registry and deploying a Docker image. But the part is when it works. Yeah, so that's the old one that we canceled. No, this is the one that we canceled. It's yellow. It's kind of hard for me to show the demo if mine doesn't work. I'm glad the engineers are here. Mike left before this, right? Of course he did. But anybody else has gone, turned blue? Or is it, are you facing the same issue I am? So just don't do anything yet until we figure out how I'm going to fix mine. What? Yours is up? Yeah. Okay. Anybody else is up? Who's not up? Me, you and me and you? Same issue? No, same? I, I haven't. No, I'm in front of you. The guy with the eyeglasses. You got, you're not as up and it looks like mine? Oh, no. My uh, page is refreshing. Your page is refreshing. Awesome. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to walk you guys because I don't want you guys to wait for now. Uh, Mikael, I give you permission to do whatever you need to do to make mine work. Looking doesn't really help so much. I need you to fix it. 
Um, this is where you end up when you try to mess up with somebody else. Exactly. Should I just do a whole, should I just read it? Anyway, I want to keep you guys going. All right? So the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to actually, and I can do this, hopefully. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm actually going to go back to, I'm going to click on the top right. For those who actually have it working, you're going to click on the top right and you're going to say add to project. And you're going to say Mongo. And we're going to, for today, we're going to pick MongoDB ephemeral. So what this means is, it's, do you know about persistent volume claims in OpenShift? Everybody kind of knew about OpenShift? Okay. We're using Kubernetes under the hood. In Kubernetes, the systems administrator makes volumes accessible to the developers. That's called a persistent volume. When you spin something up, you can ask for a persistent volume claim. That claim... When you say ephemeral, that says make a claim to the disk space running in the Docker image. Docker images are immutable. So if that image goes down, any data that you had stored in the ephemeral one will go away. If I said persistent, it would actually attach to one of the persistent volumes that are available and store the data there. For today, we're just going to store our data inside the Docker image. So that if your Docker image dies or you restart it, the data will go away. Okay, so click MongoDB ephemeral. You can, Grant, what did you name the service? Uh, MLB Parks. So the database schema name is, service name is MLB Parks? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, are you sure? So I'd leave the service as MongoDB. I think, this, I think the service name is MongoDB, Grant. Yeah. Uh, MongoDB. I already have it running. I just want to back up and go to the project. I like Grant was raised by wolves, though. That's why it's not working. <laughs> <laughs> So here's, I'll look at Grants. Yeah, it's just called MongoDB. Okay, so you're just gonna leave that name alone on Grant was raised by wolves or whatever you named yours. Oh, it's running. Did you fix it or did it just do it automatically? Uh, I, I just, do two clicks, I just scale it up. Okay. It fixed itself. Yeah, it's here for self healing. It's self healing. Oh. Self-healing, nice. Uh, we did that on purpose to show the self-healing properties of OpenShift 3. Yeah. Okay, so leave it as MongoDB. We're going to have it generate... No, uh, Grant, did you set the username and password? No. Okay, so then just leave it alone. Well, okay. You, if you're going to do it manually, you do need to set it to MLBRX or something. The Mongo user was MLB Parks. Yeah. So change the username to MLB Parks. Do you remember what the password was? No. MLB Parks. The database is going to be MLB Parks as well. Yeah. What? That don't work. It doesn't matter. Oh, it doesn't matter because it'll make a database on the fly. Yeah. The admin password doesn't matter. Let it generate it if it's empty. So what this is using is a JSON template behind the scenes. And so what it, you notice how this says generated if empty. It says I can fill this in and provide it. Everything is MLB Parks. Once you go to the next page. So this service name should remain in MongoDB. This should be renamed MongoDB. Everything else is MLB Parks. And uh, generate the And you don't have to worry about the administrator password. That will actually generate some random password that we don't actually care about because we're not going to use it. But for everything else, it's going to fill those values in. Right? And we don't do anything with the labels. So go ahead and say create. So if we continue back to the overview again. How do we get rid of this one? You could delete. It's not deleted. So you should see, this, and this one should actually be relatively quick. Like almost by the time you get over there, the blue should come up. Is that true? Anybody? Did it come up already for you? Since you're the only one in the gray, or you're the only one brave enough to answer usually? Did it already work for you? Yeah. Okay. It didn't work for me. What happened? Uh, Ryan, can you check, please? Okay. So now we have a Mongo database running. Does everybody have that? No? What happened on yours? Uh, okay. Zero. Yeah, it looks yeah. like it's 
way it could be waiting for resources if there's already all the pods are already oh, yeah. allocated. It's waiting for enough memory to be available. It, it, that might be the case, or the platform. could be waiting for the It could be waiting for the Docker image to get to the node that they're on. Yeah. yeah. So the the other thing that happens here, because we're the first ones really using this cluster. What happens, I don't know, or did we preload this with all the Docker images? It should be pre-populated. Oh, then I don't know what's going on. I, I don't know what's happening. I can go through and figure it out. I used this environment in this morning's workshop, and I bet somebody scaled up to like two or three hundred. Nah, I'm, I'm monitoring the, the, the polls from in, in the nodes. It's, yeah. oh, every node has like two, less than 30 polls. Okay. So we have 15 gig of memory. We have eight CPUs per node. We have capacity of 100 no, uh, pods per node, and on all nodes, it's from 20 to 29. I've got a backup server as well. <laughs> but resources are there. Okay. This should not be proper. Okay, so I'm just going to keep going forward. Sorry. I apologize in advance for this. So let's just keep going. If I go, for those who do have it up, you're going to be like the last man standing. You should get like three, oh no, I can't give you any more scarves. I can give you like something else that has nothing to do with anything that you actually did, but just because you got lucky. Um, so if I actually now go to this pod for the, I have to actually change something though, right? What happened is automatic, when this one gets restarted, it's going to actually automatically pick up some environment variable names for the MongoDB stuff. What Kubernetes does is for every service that comes up, it automatically, and all the other running pods, will insert environment variables for the service. What it will not insert, though, is the username and password. Right? And so I now have to go into, this is where I should bring up Grant's tutorial. See, it's, somebody, it's something about it on your laptop. The, app, the internet, because it's really fast here. Okay, so here's the, the we're going to have to insert these environment variables in, yeah? Uh, this one, the admin password doesn't matter though. We're not going to use it. Okay? Oh no, Grant, we do use it. The map app uses it? No, I don't think the map uses it. I don't think it does. Okay, let's just try it without it. What we're going to have to do is insert these environment variables. So when you want to insert environment variables into a service or a set of pods, you need to do it at the deployment config. So we're going to go ahead and do that now. And the way we're going to do that is I'm going to go to my... Oh, I finally cleaned that one up. I'll tell you where. I'll show you. I'll put it up on the screen. I promise to leave it before I sit save. So we're going to go browse to deployments. We're going to go to the MLB parts deployments because we need to put the usernames and passwords in available to the, uh, the Java code. Right? And what we're going to do is edit. Do I really have to edit it raw? Or you could use a CLI. <laughs> yeah, I know. You're gonna. I'm gonna need to make this bigger, except it doesn't increase there. Is that good? Yeah, Mark. Uh, the problem problematic application was map my map map. That was me. That's yours. Yeah. Is the failing one? Yeah. It's up. It worked. Oh, it works now. Yeah, it came up before. So healing. What? So yeah, it's working. There's no problem. Okay. There. Okay, so you see this where it says ENV? Everybody, did everybody get to this screen? Who's following along? You scroll, you, again, I'll get there again. You're at the deployment. You're seeing MLB parts deployment. You say these three dots on the, on the right side. Are you finally up in the black shirt? Yes, but I don't see MLB parts. So go, go to browse again. Deployments. I see, I see MongoDB and map. 
Uh, I have the same issue. Mm -hmm. so I don't see any of the parts. What, oh, what did you name? Uh, you named it Matt. I so think maybe in our case, case it's Matt. 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 Yeah, it should be. It's switched over. Right. There should, you should only have two deployments. Yeah. Pick the one that's not MongoDB. Okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> it should have actually. Oh, did you fork the repo and change the name or something? Uh, no. I, I forked it, but I haven't changed anything. I love this. All right. Whatever the one is not MongoDB, open that deployment. Then on the top right over here, you'll see it three dots. See them? Yeah. Click on that and say edit. <laughs> what now? What? I don't like that. Oh. Okay. <laughs> I'm just like, I'm got back. It should open up some a YAML file. Is everybody looking at a YAML file like Any, this? Anyone else need help? <laughs> no. Everybody's got a YAML file. Okay. You're going to scroll down in the YAML file until you see this env where it says like open shift kube ping labels application equals mlb parts can you scroll up just slightly so they know if they don't have an environment this should be part of the container spec it should be part you should see this look for the big long url that has like this is the this is the um, docker registry internal one and that's the docker image right Keep scrolling. It should be past that where it says ports. Check the line. It's always going to be in the exact same line number. Yes. All right. I'd like to put money on that one. It, supposedly, according to the engineers, you should be able to get to line sixty-one, and that should be the ENV. Is that true? No. Yes. Nice. You owe me. You're buying my Xperia tomorrow. My my Z5. We have bad news for you. Yeah. It's different labels though. You you want uh, these are not the right names. It, these are fine. We're not changing these yet. Leave those alone. Oh uh, yeah. Don't yeah. change anything. Don't change anything. Did anybody change anything? I have him adding an ENV section because he has no ENV section. How does he have no ENV section? He didn't. He didn't it, in your MLB Parks one or whatever it was. I have the same map. So please, just have them use the command line tool. I have the instructions. In the but then they all have to download the command line tool. Okay. The hands-on part of this lab is officially now over. <laughs> you are going to watch me do it on the screen and be impressed by how smooth and easy it is. <laughs> Okay, everybody, ready? <laughs> I'm going to add some environment variables. Is that dash needed, actually? You can just go there and add. So, yeah. so it is actually on line 66. Mm -hmm. They are on the wrong project. Yes, we are in another project right now, not in the previous one you created. So you owe me. <laughs> Wait, what am I in? <laughs> Grant was raised by wolves or a different? Yeah. Oh, I'm in MLB Parks. This one. That was my fault. Ah, <laughs> uh, there's the stuff. So there's my there's the name of mine, which is Mappy Map Map. Yours is called whatever. I'm going to that deployment. There, that's it. Yeah. Okay. I don't know you yet. We'll see. Edit. The line should be. No, not yet. Not yet. You're right. There are absolutely no environment variables anywhere in it. <laughs> How can that? You didn't add any, I guess. I took Grant's code and used Grant's code directly. Where did Grant's come from? If I think he adds them in his work. He doesn't add that coup ping stuff and all that? No, no. I don't so know. So where did those come from? I love this stuff. I love that's my job. Probably, that's probably okay, so it actually Java template. It's from a Java application template. But well, that's what we used as well. But the Java application template doesn't know that you need Mongo. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes, Merrick. Is anyone using a user higher than 10? And it works for you? No. Um, I have the same problem. Like, no, there are no names. 
Okay, I'm gonna I'm going to clean all the projects for users 10 and up. Just okay. to clean up the resources, just to make sure. Okay. Because the online, the hands-on portion of this demo is now over. <laughs> you can add in an ENV. Yeah, I have to, and so it should be right here, right? Right, I'd put and it right above ports, and yeah. just follow the same structure as ports. Yeah, that's what I was thinking too. So I'm going to do this, and hit enter. It put me in the wrong spot. Mark, can you spare uh, number 10? Can you help me how to select these things? I have a regular experience. Really? I love this typing. That's... It's YAML too, right? So indentation matters. Yeah. yeah. Do you see where my cursor is? Can you I, see my I cursor? Hate, I hate yes. YAML. I'm Jakob? Okay. <laughs> do you see where my cursor is? Who? Now watch when I start typing. <laughs> <laughs> this is a so actually the entire part of the me showing this interactively is now done. <laughs> I'm going to go to Grant's demo that's actually completely running and finished and I'll show you what was in there. You can just... <laughs> this is actually editing the the YAML file. <laughs> oh. Just sorry. Okay, because how much more time do we have left? Can someone do a time check for me? How much? Three zero. Okay. If you guys want to follow along, I think everybody has an MLB parks inside of their user. Is that true? Grant, no, do not take a picture of this. <laughs> so if you want, this, we're doing a panel tomorrow at the last session called uh, So You Want to Be a Developer Evangelist. And then we're probably going to ask a question, what was your most embarrassing moment on stage? <laughs> this will be in my top three. <laughs> 20 minutes? Okay. So I'm going to go back to the overview. I'm going to go back to the project called MLB Parks. This one's already done and it's running for you. But it's running for you. Yeah. For you know. no, I, but everybody has it. Everybody should have, I think everybody has an MLB part. I don't know. I don't know. Just do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, keep watching the screen, please. You can jump right to deploying the Yeah, I'm going to go look at that now. <laughs> Here, this is the deployment for MLB parks. And there's going to be something. <laughs> if I actually look at it now. There better be. Okay, there we go. How does it? Which one did he use? He hasn't gone all the way through. Okay. So what we're going to actually do here, we're editing it. The MongoDB user. That is awesome. I can't use the... Should I open it? It's in Firefox. Should I try it in something else? Yeah, probably. But you have to take care of the identification and also have to use this. Do you think Chrome... You guys test more in Chrome? And this... Uh, and everything. So you should use Safari. I should use Safari. I should use IE. Where's those uh, .NET guys? It has like uh, this uh, dashes. Which dash is... Uh, so, yeah, add dash and then you can add the name. What? I don't have any MongoDB section or it should be in the MongoDB server. No, no. The, so there's a YAML file. So if we look at, if we go, here, let me just show you something. If we go back to the MongoDB YAML file, right? And I look at the, if I look at the, um, you should be in the application. That was the one I was telling you to be in. But if you look here, there's, there's environment variables. Right? Does everybody see those environment variables in the MongoDB one? If you look in the MongoDB one. Yeah, and I see there and everywhere is MLB Parks. And everywhere, yours is everywhere is MLB So, so this one, he just, he used the raw ones that were generated and he must have copied and pasted, whoever did this. Okay? But you'll see, this has some environment variables. If we had been able to do this properly, and I was able to demo it, I would have opened the terminal into the MLB Parks pod. All right, so if I go to pods and I go to the MLB Parks pod and I go to the terminal, and let me see if I can make this bigger. Can you guys see that now? 
in the back. Yeah. Yeah. And I do E N V E N V grep Mongo. If I had done this before I had set the environment variables in the application deployment config, not in the database one, but the application piece, the ones where it's, see where it said, there, you would have everything, like the path, the port, the host, but you wouldn't have the username and the password. Kubernetes handles put injecting the service IPs and ports and all that stuff, but it has no concepts of usernames and passwords and all that. So that is why we needed to go into the deployment config for the application and say, hey, you know what? You need this environment variable for the username, the passwords, and the database. We're going to put those into the deployment. When we save those changes, it would restart, it would redeploy the pod for the application and then insert the environment variables the way it did here. Does that make sense? Kind of, yeah? yeah. We basically, Kubernetes can handle how things get plugged in together, but it can't handle the pieces about usernames and passwords. So we need to manually go in, insert those environment variables, and restart the pod, okay? And then once you do that, your application should look Go back to the, oh, it's so, there. If I go back to the overview, hmm. it should look like this. Yeah. How much time do we have left? <laughs> 15 minutes? So I'll show, I'll walk you through the code now, which was the part I was supposed to do. I was supposed, this part was supposed to go incredibly smoothly, and then we could have spent our time looking at what the code did, okay? So here, if I go back to the Git repo. Okay, so here I am in the Git repo. Actually, it turns out if we really wanted this to work right, there's actually the JSON file in the Git repo. This JSON file here, this defines an entire application. It defines the pods. All right, can you guys, you guys trying to fix it, either whisper or wait until afterwards. Yeah. I don't care right now. No, not you, Merrick. I'm not talking about you. You guys were quiet. So this actually is the same as that YAML, except for the entire thing, right? So it defines the services. It uses parameters for like the application name. There's the route. There's the image stream. There's the build configs. It does all that stuff. You just run that JSON file, and it would spin up that entire application. So in the future, that's something, if you want to see the whole application working, that's a good way to do it, okay? Now in terms of the code, let's go ahead and look at the code. So I'm going to start from the beginning, which is the database. And if I go into, here you can see this is, so this is using, Mongo actually has, the Java driver for Mongo actually has its own connection pool. I don't actually need to set up its own connection pool. So basically all I'm doing here is I'm loading the Mongo class once, and then I'm going to inject it, and I'm gonna hold it in, this, in the application context, and then use CDI to inject it whenever I need it. Okay? So here, after I create this object, I'm actually loading up the usernames and passwords and the hosts if they're, if they're an environment variable. I load them up. If they're not, I actually go ahead and set, assume it's on localhost. Has everybody got that? You see what I'm doing there? There, I'm basically, from the container, I'm going to say, hey, go give me these environment variable information, and I set it in my code. And then I basically go ahead and look, basic, here we are, there's our new Mongo driver. We've loaded it up. It's in the scope of the object. We get the DB. We already knew the DB was MLB Parks. And this is the interesting part. He's calling init database. What he's doing in init database is he's checking to see if the park collection already exists. Right? So he's saying, hey, get the collection teams. If the park li list collections that count is less than one, that means there's nothing in it. That means we actually have to load the database. And so what he does through here is he actually is pulling in the JSON file 
and then sending that directly to Mongo to insert all the objects that are in that JSON file. That JSON file looks like this. Right? So he's got the name of the team, their payroll, the ballpark. But then if you scroll over a little bit, we are not doing it the right way. We're actually doing a 2D. Right? We're just saying coordinates. We're, and then we just insert the coordinates in. Does everybody see that? That's all the JSON is. If we go back at the end of this, It's all finished, right? All the teams are, he says another team is imported, he just keeps going, and then he's all done, okay? So now we've got the database loaded. Now we actually need to make the web services. So if we go back up one more class, go to MLB Parks, here's the REST interfaces. So this is what JAX-RS allows Java developers to do. We're basically saying anything that comes into the server, it's URL slash parks, gets handled by this class. Then we're saying inject the database, right? Remember I said I wanted to be able to inject it wherever I'm using it, so I'm injecting it here. So now I've got the database connection. And so this method will get called so it's saying when something comes in for parts, it does get collections and it basically pulls back the entire collection and returns it to those and it serializes it out. Right? And it returns it. The other one I want here is get within. So here we're going to use the intersection query from Mongo to get everything from the bounding box. So if there's a get to the path parks slash within, it's going to call this method. Does everybody get how that works? So when a URL, the, the JAXRS router says, hey, if something comes into slash parks slash within, call this method. And it's expecting that there's going to be a four different query parameters, lat1, long1, lat2, long2. This is obviously not production code because what am I not doing here? Checking for bad values. Exactly. I basically just assume you know what you're doing and you're passing in the lat-longs that are expected. Okay? And then what you're doing is you're making... So here's the... you get the parts collection. And then in Mongo, what you do is you make objects to make the queries. So I'm making an object. I'm making a list to make the box. And then I'm, to the box list, I add one corner and the other corner. So basically what I'm doing is I'm making an array list that has two points in it, one corner and the other corner. And I'll show you where I get these corners from when we get to the leaflet code. Then I say, Box query, put a box, and then I'm putting the array of those two corners. Right? So we're doing a, a box search with those two corners. Then I'm doing a spatial query, put the coordinates equals to the coordinates coming in within the box query. Right? So I make a box, then I say, here's the spatial query that says where the coordinates are within the box query. And then it's just a normal um, Mongo search, which is Mongo find, and I pass in that query that I've made. And that's just going to return back all the parts, and then we'll send that back as JSON. Does everybody got that? Does that make sense? Kind of. I'm sending in two pairs of coordinates. I create a box from that. I then say this box is my spatial query, and I want to find everything within this box basically what I'm doing in that code. So the core, and then that just returns a bunch of JSON. So the part that now handles all that is the, I don't know, it's gonna be here. Yep, 
in here. Can I make this one font smaller? Tell me if this is okay still. Is that still okay in the back? Yeah? Okay. So I'm going to show, now we're doing leaflet. Okay, we're done with all our Java code. We're done with all our Manga code. How do we display a bunch of uh, JSON objects? So the only thing that's required, I don't think there's actually any of the script links in the top. The script link, I think, is in the bottom. No? Where do I load it up? They're right here. The only thing that's required is we're going to load the leaflet.js. So it's its own JavaScript library. I'm pulling it from a CDN. You could actually put it on the local machine if you want. The only HTML in this is these two elements. Div1 ID. Div, and then the div that's called a map. If I highlight it, does it make it harder to read? Yes? Okay. Can it, is that better now? It's the yellow on the top. So basically what I'm doing there is I'm making a div that I'm giving a title to called map. And the reason why we need this is because we need to be able to plop a map into an, like a container to plop the map into on the page. So here we go. Let me find it. Okay. So the way what we start, what we start up with is we define a center point, which is the center of the United States. We set a zoom level. So in most new web maps, they have predefined zoom levels. So we're setting the zoom level to five, which is basically the entire extent of the United States. Okay. Then we say, hey, we're making a map. So L stands for leaflet, map. This is here. What container are we putting it in? So that refers back up to this map, right? The ID back up here. Everybody got that? We're basically saying what container to put that in. And then we're setting the view. We're saying it's center and the zoom level. So now we've defined inside of that container, we have a map. Here's the lat long and here's the zoom level. It doesn't have anything in it yet, though. We want the tile layer to be underneath of it. So we make a tile layer. This is the well-known URL in Leaflet to represent tile layers coming from OpenStreetMap, coming from lots of places, actually. Now we're saying on this map, the maximum zoom level I can go in is till 18. And here's the attribution that I, that I want you to put on the bottom right-hand corner of the map. So now we've made a tile layer, and we add that tile layer to the map. So if we stop right here, this is what we get when we didn't have any pins on the map. That's all the code you need to produce a slippy map that you can move around and zoom in and zoom out and center it in places. But we want pins on the map, right? So what we do here, down here at the bottom, we say map when ready, get pins, map on drag, end, get pins, and map on zoom and get pins. So if I, when I first load the map, and if I drag or zoom, call this get pins function. Okay? And this is what get pins looks like. Get pins is very simple. Map, so I'm talking to the map again, give me your boundaries. And what that returns is the bounding box actual visible on the screen. Which is then, what we feed back into WS Parks Within. Remember, we needed a the corners of a box. So all we're doing is saying, hey, Matt, tell me your boundaries so I can pass that in to the rest call on the back end. So I do that, and then I say, that's the URL, and I say, I make an Ajax call to my rest service, get URL, and pin the map is what I want to be the callback, and it's going to be in JSON format. Right? That simple jQuery right there. Everybody good with that so far? Have I lost everybody already? Kind of? No? We're good? We're almost done. I don't know what this, oh, this is because I'm ignoring that. That's him dealing with dollar values and stuff. Yeah. Not, in, not important. <laughs> um, Only if you want to display currency. Yeah, which I never do, because I don't care about money. Um, the function, but remember I said on the callback, the function is pin the map. 
So the first thing we do is we have a marker layer group that we remove. So the marker layer group is a place where you're going to put all the markers on the map. Right? So if it's already there, I want to if it's already there, I want to clear them all out because I've panned or zoomed the map. And I don't want to end up putting multiple layers of pins again and again all over the map. I want to clear the one that's already there. Then, remember the callback, this is the, the data that came back from the callback. I basically loop through it and I make I make some pop-up information and some more pop-up information, and then I make a marker. And the marker is actually what is the pin. So I give it a position, I give it the X and the Y, and I bind the pop-up information to it. So for those of you who finally got it to work, did anybody finally get it to work? I'll show you in a second. Or can I show you here? Did I already get it running? No, I never got it running either. Uh, you can uh, have it running. Go and back to the project list. Uh, go to MLB Corporation. Yeah. Uh, it's that oh, yeah, it was running. I remember now. If I click on this, this is the pop-up information. Right? So we've bound that to the, to the pin so that whenever you click on it, that's what shows up. There's a ton of other things you could do with it in Leaflet. And so then, finally... After we've made, we make one of those markers for each pin. We put those into an array, right? So we say in the array list, put that marker. We take that array list of markers and we add that to the map and then automatically knows to just display them all. And that's it. So I know it took me a long time to talk through it all, but if you actually look at this to add pins to a map, that's actually not much code. This is just an Ajax call. This is just setting up the map. These, I don't know, 10 lines is all it needs to put pins on a map with the pop-up information and still respect all the zooming around and all that other stuff. So if I go back to my slides, Spatial is easy, not necessarily with the OpenShift part thrown in, but if this was in other ways, it's really easy. Um, it's so simple, even a marketing person can do it. So how many of you actually work at Red Hat? Who doesn't work at Red Hat? Okay, so you won't know who Gordon is, but Gordon is, Gordon is one of the people at our company who talks to analysts. So he's pretty, imagine, if you think about people who speak to analysts, they know nothing about code, and they're usually pretty high level. He wrote this app with that same infrastructure. So what this is, is river gauge stations around Boston. He works at our Massachusetts office. He likes canoeing. And the United States Geologic Survey publishes feeds of, of all these monitoring stations on rivers. So if he wants to know, hey, I want to go out canoeing. How's this river over by North Reading doing? It's at 1.61 feet, 28 cubic feet per second at that point in time. And they actually put in a link to the river gauge information on the USGS site. And he did that in about a day for a non-technical person. People have actually taken this template of his application, and like in Spain, they've produced a map of all the national historic trees. Apparently there's big old trees in Spain, and they care about them enough that they've mapped them all, and they have a database of it. And if we did that in the United States, some hooligan would go out and kill all those trees almost immediately. But in Spain, that's apparently not the case. You can make a map like that for almost anything you want to do. Yeah, Grant. Did you talk about the template yet? Yes. Oh, you did? I, I, yeah, right, guys? I talked about how there was that JSON file that defined everything in the application, and you didn't have to do all those steps manually. And I will repeat it myself. Uh, do you run out to the document uh, where the steps would When I would like to repeat this myself. When you want to do this yourself? I'm, I'm going to You're not going to be able to on this instance? Because this have, instance, have instance. You have your own instance? So the doc, this, I didn't put that in there because I wasn't, I know, I know, I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to give it to you. Hold on, hold on. No, no, no. Here. It is, this is our roadshow information. Let me put it, hold on. No, I don't want that. This is our roadshow. Um, it's actually uh, slash devconf. Slash what? Devconf. Slash not roadshow, slash devconf. Yeah. There's a new version. Yeah. 
if you want to use like the all-in-one Vagrant image that uh, Jorge was talking about or that you can download from or openshift.org slash VM, you can run through this using this training material. Except I don't know that you can use, can you use the EAP one? I don't know if we published that one. And this should work, this should work with the ordinary uh, You can use the yes, yeah, well fly, I guess. No. Or is there any template? So that was a good question. The question was, you're saying this should work with, are you talking about online? Yes. Sir. Okay, so the current version of online is running V2. Okay. <laughs> so the version, which is the, what, Grant? I have a repo for V2. I do too. There's a ton of repos of this that... And my repo is better because it doesn't do parks. It actually does. It doesn't do baseball. It does national parks. And, um, also, this does run on the all-in-one. It does run on the all-in-one. Okay. Um, but the thing that you wanted to know the repo. Actually, you remember how we went to talks to Steve Zero dot com? If you actually just go to, not that, but this, and instead of saying. Um, it's just JEE -E map. Is it JEE -E maps? No, it's not JEE -E maps. It's JEE -E map. V2. And that's all. That is the example for V2. Oh, okay. Without the V3. Okay? And that one works flawlessly <laughs> every single time. Okay. Yes? Did the V3 work closely every single time until today? Yes. We did a, a bazillion road shows using Origin V, I mean, uh, OpenShift Enterprise 3.1. What? Uh, okay. And it worked flawlessly at every road show. But there's something very interesting going on today. The V3 is under the No, it's actually been released. There's OpenShift Enterprise which is where you can install that on your own cluster, either on Amazon or whatever, and that's actually released GA, you can pay for it and get support and all that other stuff. Um, I, online, will be sometime later this year, we'll be moving over. over. It's not in development though. There is a development version, which is the upstream, we call it Origin. Yeah, the migration part will be fun. Any other questions? Uh, just a comment. Uh, yeah. If you want to do your own spatial data, your spatial maps, and you have to find some data. Steve probably knows a lot more open source ways to get it, but I always use agdata.com. Agdata? AG? AGG data. They have the JSON data sets for anything you could imagine um, for location, but they're paid. They're like $20 for a, a full disk or stuff. Uh, What's the redistribution rights on that data? I don't know. Okay. So you may not be able to do, you may be able to do analysis with it. You may not be able to display it. Check the display, the right time. Thanks, everyone. Sorry. Good. <laughs> you you have a very good damage control. Thank you. <laughs> At least you're on the wide network. I've been fine for the whole weekend until about okay. halfway like through your talk. <laughs> I used to sort of vote for it. Uh, yeah, nice. I've been fighting with that nice. as well. Ah, oh, I should find a cut. Drink, sir. Okay, I need to get you around through it by hand. Me? Yeah, you said I'm not finding. Go, 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 go. Yeah. Go, go, go.